Hey everyone, we're here at the U.S. Naval War College, and I'm met by the museum curator, uh, and he's going to walk us through it. So, Rob Doan, uh, he's going to give us an overview of the museum, what's here on display, but then we're going to start off actually with the history of the museum and a bit of the War College itself, walk through each of the rooms, uh, and kind of the thread that's going to tie us all together is the development of the War College as a training institution and then later uh, for teaching wargaming. So let's go ahead and start us off here. Yeah, great, thanks very much. So yeah, we're standing in the Naval War College Museum, which is located in the original building where the War College was uh, first set up in 1884. Um, it's not here anymore, it's all in the campus, kind of in surrounding buildings. But it started out here. Um, in 1883, the Navy bought the island that we're on, Coasters Harbor Island, from the state of Rhode Island. Um, it had been used, this building had been built in 1820 and used as the poorhouse for the town of Newport. And so over the years, it was mostly used as um, an orphanage, an asylum. At various times, it was pretty much anybody they didn't want in downtown Newport. <laughs> they kind of stuck them out here. Um, so it was used that way until the state built a new uh, state asylum, and, and it was available then, so the Navy bought it. Um, it has its roots uh, from during the Civil War. Uh, the Naval Academy down in Annapolis, Maryland, had actually relocated up to Newport during the war. Um, at the time, they were afraid that Maryland was going to join the Confederacy, and so they were looking for a safe place to relocate the Naval Academy where they could keep training the midshipmen and not have to worry about being displaced. So they came up here in 1861 and were here in Newport for the duration of the war. Um, and a couple of the, um, this panel here is showing you the staff and faculty of the academy. So there are two names that are really important to the, the early years of the college, and that's Alfred Thayer Mahan and Stephen B. Luce. Um, Luce is the one who really pushes for the establishment of a new school that kind of joins with the academy in terms of being the system of professional education that the Navy gave its officers. So he was uh, very much a reforming voice in the Navy. He was really interested in changing the ways that both enlisted and officers, uh, uh, personnel in the Navy, got trained. And so when he looked around at kind of the landscape of education in the late 1880s, he saw that the Navy did a really good job of training junior officers at the start of their careers. So everybody who went to the Naval Academy got a really good solid four years of uh, education and things like steam engineering, uh, physics, math, French, languages, uh, history, um, and it was all enough to be able to equip you to operate really well as a junior officer and take care of kind of the low-level leadership uh, challenges that junior officers have to deal with. But for people who made a career out of the Navy, if you actually rose to the rank of a captain or an admiral, you really didn't have any school that taught you how to deal with the kinds of uh, problems and issues that, that high-ranking officers have to deal with. It was just expected that you would pick up those skills as you went along your career, that you would learn from others around you. Um, and people certainly did. It's not to say that that system didn't work. Um, it produced some really fantastically successful officers over the years. But Luce felt like there was probably a better way, that really there needed to be another school where um, you took sort of a break in the middle of your career and came back in if you were out to sea and, and spent a year here in Newport studying tactics, and strategy, um, international relations, um, all the things that the more senior level officers have to deal with. And a, a question here actually, so to what degree did they look for outside input for modeling this new school? So they, um, they certainly looked to a couple different places. One was to Europe. Um, right especially the Germans, who were very much um, the ones kind of uh, at that time pushing the development of uh, things like professional staffs, wargaming, war colleges. They were kind of on the leading edge of that through much of the 1800s. And a lot of that comes from their experience um, fighting Napoleon and having been conquered by Napoleon and doing a lot mm -hmm. of sort of having a time after the Napoleonic Wars to sit and think about what went wrong for them and why weren't they able to be successful against uh, France's armies. And so they really develop a whole system of education for their officers that extends to war colleges, war gaming, uh, more professional training. So a lot of U.S. Navy officers in the 1870s and 80s spent time traveling through uh, Europe, um, studied what other navies were doing, other armies were doing, and got some uh, inspiration from that as well. Um, the U.S. Navy also took some ideas from the U.S. Army. Um, they were involved in um, um, kind of the same thing at the same time. Um, William McCarty Little, who's the naval officer who's most credited for bringing wargaming into the college, 
had some army officers who he was friends with, and they were experimenting with wargaming too. So they were all talking to each other about what they were doing. You know, the army navy rivalry was not uh, you know enough of a barrier that they didn't want to share ideas with each other. So, and the army was right here in Newport at Fort Adams. Um, they were doing wargaming out there too, and the navy, the naval war college, and the Fort Adams actually did a joint exercise in 1887 where they did sort of a mock battle on a landing over here in, uh, hmm. by where the Naval Academy Prep School is at Covington Cove now, where they were doing joint training and, and uh, doing sort of like fleet exercises to test different strategies and tactics. So, so all of those things play into kind of how the early curriculum for the War College is set up. You know? I see. So yeah, we have the need, and then they're going out getting experts, seeing how they want to structure it. Um, so as they're setting up the college, I also see all these different vessels out here, and I think you'd said it served as like a port for some of the Navy as well? Yeah, the Newport itself was definitely uh, the home port for a lot of naval vessels um, up to the 1970s. So if you had been here in World War One or World War II, um, the, the Atlantic Fleet made its way through here several times in the early 1900s. The Great White Fleet, soon after it came back from its cruise around the world, um, spent uh, some time here in Narragansett Bay, and we have some great photos of them anchored right where the bridge is now before it was there. I've got this whole row of battleships that's pretty impressive to look at. Um, the cruiser and destroyer force um, uh, was the main um, if you had been here in Newport in the 50s and 60s, after World War II, you would have seen a lot of destroyers and cruisers, the smaller ships. They were home ported here for a long time, and they did a lot of um, training where the focus was on taking the crews of those ships. And, and um, after you get out of basic training, um, you're bringing all these people together who have you know, gone through basic training, and then you have to make them into a crew and gave them, form them sort of into a team, have everybody learn their individual tasks on the ship. So they were doing a lot of that sort of like pre-deployment training here in Newport for a long time too. Makes sense. Okay, well thanks for the context and I guess we can move on with the visit. Is there anything to touch on uh, in this room then? Um, so we basically, uh, what you see kind of more over this way is what um, the, the prehistory of the Navy's presence in Newport. Even before the U.S. Navy was here, the Newport was the scene of a lot of naval activity, especially during the American Revolution because um, Newport is occupied by the British um, right after the fall of Boston. Um, and then they're here for a good few years until the French show up um, after the French entry into the war, and it becomes the main uh, base for the French Navy in 1779. So, um, so we talk about um, uh, some of the, the British ships that were sunk here. When the French show up, they actually trap parts of the British Navy in there, Gansett Bay. Hmm. The British didn't want their ships to be captured by the French, so they scuttled them and sank them on purpose, and we have some artifacts from those ships on display. Understood. Okay, so these are the foundations of the history then, mm -hmm. so I think that's a good place to stop here, so we'll continue on with the visit. All right, so we're now here in the torpedo room, and it does mostly cover torpedoes, but it's going to be a coverage of the different technology as it progressed throughout the years and how the Naval War College adapted it. So, uh, Rob, I'll let you take it away. Sure. So, um, this gallery deals a lot with uh, the Navy's experimentation and uh, development of torpedoes, and that story kind of starts during the Civil War when um, the Navy had torpedoes, but um, they, what we call mines today, are what they referred to as torpedoes. So these were stationary things. Stationary um, that, torpedoes. Stationary okay. torpedoes that were just anchored um, uh, in, in water, and you hoped that the ship would run over them and it exploded. They did have these things called spar torpedoes, which you can see. Um, there's a couple of photos of them here. Um, these were used in the Civil War as well, a couple very famously against some of the Confederate ironclads when they started uh, uh, encountering ironclad warships around uh, the Richmond area. Um, and spar torpedoes were basically just a big chunk of explosive that you tied to the end of a long wooden pole or a spar. <laughs> you can see how yeah. you have this mounted out in front yeah, of Yeah, it's boat. literally like a, a, a ram with a yeah. bomb at the end. <laughs> it looks like a suicide weapon. It wasn't. <laughs> but <laughs> the idea was um, you had to use these things at night, and hopefully, you know, there was not a full moon. Hopefully, it was foggy. There was very low visibility. And you basically tried to sneak up on a ship with one of these things and ram the torpedo into the side of it and try and get kind of like just underneath the hull where it would explode upward and punch a hole in the bottom of the hull that couldn't repair, that would sink it. So then at the facilities here, you're saying this is where they developed some of this kind of engineering work, but then also the 
application of it as well? So what they did here was try to figure out the next thing after spar torpedoes, because as you can tell from the description, like spar torpedoes were incredibly dangerous to use for sure. the crew and, and uh, you know, could very easily backfire on you if you didn't have really good luck. Um, you had to be able to obviously get close enough to the ship and, and to use this thing in the first place. And then even if you did, once you set it off, it just as often sank the ship that was carrying it mm. as the one you were attacking. So after the Civil War, the question of the Navy was, you know, there has to be a better way. <laughs> How can we, you know, turn this thing into a weapon that you can shoot and stay at a safe distance? So on Goat Island here in Newport, which is the scene of a, um, had been one of the forts guarding the entrance to uh, Newport Harbor. The British had used it a long time uh, when, uh, before uh, the U.S. gained its independence. Um, but the torpedo station was set up on Goat Island as a place to start figuring out all the engineering and the, the technology of how you would perfect what they called an automotive torpedo. So yeah. these torpedoes here are the first two types of automotive torpedoes the Navy used. Uh, the fish torpedo on top was an experimental one, so it was never actually used in practice. Um, but the fish torpedo, I mean, it looks, you know, not terribly different from what torpedoes look like today. I think everybody would kind of recognize it for what it is, but um, they, you know, again, packed some explosives into the head of the torpedo. This one actually ran on compressed air. So you had like a cylinder in the back here that actually provided the power for it. Um, and it did a reasonably good job. Um, one of the drawbacks was that it did uh, have a telltale trail of bubbles behind it when mm. you use compressed air. So it was very easy to spot these from a good long way away and, and turn to avoid them. Um, so uh, they experimented with that for a while, but as I didn't actually deploy it with the fleet. The first one that was actually used in operational conditions is the one on the bottom here, the Howell torpedo. Um, and it's named after its inventor, Lieutenant Commander John Howell. He had borrowed this from a British design, actually, and tinkered with it a little bit. Um, and so now it runs on an internal flywheel. Um, so there's like a big spinning flywheel that's located back here. You actually have to uh, power up. Yeah, using, manual. Yeah, oh no, my God. using a little <laughs> steam engine on board the, the, the ship that's carrying it first. And then when you set the flywheel running, it starts spinning around and turns the propellers and off it goes. That's also very good because it helps keep it uh, very stable. The centrifugal force actually helps keep it on track. Um, it wasn't very easy with the fish torpedo. Sometimes it would veer off to the left and the right didn't have quite as much of that problem with the Howell torpedo. Um, so the Howell torpedo was used in the Spanish-American War. It was carried down there. Um, still a lot of trouble getting it to really work correctly. They, the torpedo boats in the Spanish-American War actually used their guns. In That's that what I was going to say. I think often than torpedoes. the main advantage so, I think the U.S. had was just the range and the caliber of its yeah. guns more so than the torpedoes. And the U.S. Navy was really still trying to figure out how to use torpedo boats. Um, so would they have had like dummies and stuff set up in the bay here and target shoot at yeah, those? Yeah, they did that. They um, uh, they did practice shoots here in the bay, and then they would uh, go out and recover the torpedoes. Um, this diving suit down here is an example. They have divers to go down there and fish them out and bring them back up. But these early torpedo boats, you can see a couple models of them here. Um, I see. So those are the chutes right there for the torpedoes? Yeah. So the Cushing here is one of these early boats. It was built by a company just up the bay from us in Bristol, the Hershoff Manufacturing Company. The Hershoffs were big innovators in um, steam technology in the late 1800s. They're much more famous for their uh, sailing boats, their racing yachts. Mm. They built a lot of the boats that won the America's Cup uh, in their early years. But for a while, they were doing work for the Navy, too. And they built a series of torpedo boats for the Navy that were these fast little ships. These are much faster than any of the big like battleships that the Navy was trying to build at that time. But they're small. Um, they're very lightly armed, obviously. You can see there's a couple. Uh, this one has a couple guns mounted on it. Um, but there's a couple torpedo tubes mounted amidships and one torpedo tube in the bow there, too. Oh, wow. They experimented, those went away, and they took the battle <laughs> tube off uh, eventually because they couldn't get that, the, the physics of launching a torpedo underwater. It took much longer for them to actually perfect that. So in the early 1900s, they were still launching them over the sides with the torpedo gun. So then as time progresses here, we start to get into the development of early submarines, right. and then torpedoes kind of shift over. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so you have the, the early submarine, the Holland, which is the first one the U.S. Navy uh, brings over and commissions, and that's an experiment with out of the torpedo station, too. And the submarine is really, you know, what the torpedo was designed for. <laughs> that, right. You know, you can certainly use it on a surface ship, too, but its ideal platform is that you launch it underwater, and then you never know that the submarine is there, and it's able to do what it does well in terms of you know, approaching undetected and making those attacks so and this isn't deployed until after the spanish-american war in the early correct yeah they, war? they had been fits and starts with this they had actually the uh, continental uh, forces that had a very oh that's right the little of a submarine, the yeah. turtle in the american revolution and, um the confederate navy had used submarines uh, to try and break the union blockade in the civil war so um none of those were you know they uh, none of those were successful so they uh, the confederate navy did uh, get a few hits on union blockading ships but their submarines also sank in the process so mm. it was took a while until after the spanish-american war where the u.s navy finally perfects them enough that they could be used you know in mass and, and, and then in world war one they they start to really come into their own makes sense okay so this is the dive suit that you were telling us about so, yeah, for recovery and, uh, Along with the torpedo station, the Navy set up a dive school here in Newport to train Navy divers. And their original purpose was going down there and fishing up these practice torpedoes that they were shooting out into the bay so they can recover them and use them again. And um, there's a couple, uh, let's see, no, we don't have one on the panel, but every once in a while, um, people living out on Jamestown Island, it's out in the middle of the bay. Mm, fish one go into their backyards and find these big torpedoes sitting there <laughs> washed up on the beach and there's a couple of funny photographs we have of the people like walking their dogs and they're posing with this <laughs> torpedo and think oh gosh be careful i mean they weren't dumping warheads obviously so no real danger but it still looks kind of funny so um to prevent that yeah they, they train divers then to, to bring these up so uh, this early dive suit here that's um, some recreational divers still use types that look a lot like that the, the type here that's on display yeah it looks but, like um, twenty thousand leagues under the exactly. sea ancient yeah. tech mm -hmm. so. okay and so yeah the advent of submarine warfare gets us into the first world war and that's the display i guess we're seeing here yep yeah the torpedo boats um evolve over time they they pretty much evolve into what we call destroyers today um, they're called torpedo boat destroyers in their early years and they eventually evolve into these you know, small, fast platforms that are meant to sort of protect the bigger ships of the fleet against things like submarines and then later on aircraft too. Um, in World War II, they become yeah, what are called PT boats, the little really fast, you know, basically speed boats on steroids that, <laughs> that are uh, uh, these fast, uh, you know, very small crews, just a handful of people who uh, pilot these things. And they're used out in the Pacific very successfully, especially around the, all the island chains that the, the fighting was revolving around out there. Um, you can see they carry a whole mix of torpedoes and guns and anti-aircraft guns. Um, but the main base for training PT boat crews was here in Narragansett Bay at Melville, um, which is also not very far north of us, just up here uh, on the bay. And so uh, they did all their initial training there, um, including uh, John F. Kennedy, who most people have heard of in PT-109. He came through here and did his training before going off to the Pacific as well. Um, so yeah, the, the PT boats that uh, came through here, there's a couple squadron plaques you can see. Of, uh, the PT boats were almost sort of like if you've seen uh, uh, like the bomber crews in England, you know, all the nose art from mm. B-17s and B-24s. Yeah. It gets really creative. The PT boat squadrons kind of had that thing going on too. They have some really uh, creative uh, squadron plaques and logos, so you can see a little bit of what they what they did with that. I see. So during World War II, uh, the U.S. Navy unfortunately went through this big teething process with their torpedoes that a lot of the other uh, major navies who used torpedoes had the same thing. The Germans and the Japanese both went through. Uh, the same difficulty, but they figured out a lot of their problems uh, before World War II, fortunately for them. Unfortunately for us, not so much. But uh, the Mark 14, that is this torpedo you see on display here, was built and tested here uh, out on Goat Island at the torpedo station. Um, went through a long period of development before World War II. Unfortunately, the testing that they did wasn't really done under real world conditions. So there were a couple of problems that ended up making the actual performance of the torpedo not what it was here mm. and under ideal testing circumstances. And so 
first views of World War II, um, a lot of the submarine and destroyer captains who were actually trying to fire these at Japanese ships uh, found that they either weren't exploding, they were going off course, right. and then in a few cases, um, worst of all, they would actually run in a circle and come around and hit the ship that had just fired it, and a couple of U.S. submarines were actually sank that way. Okay, so yeah, and I think pretty, it's uh, relatively decisive in the early stages of Midway. Torpedo boats or ships are launched, but they never they think they score hits, but they ding off the hull yeah. or they go under. So yeah, the early years I know were plagued by issues. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, they and there were a number of different uh, reasons why that was. Um, one of the submarine captains of the Pacific was so fed up with this that he actually set up a test. I uh, think he was uh, anchored at, uh, in port in Australia at the time, and so he rigged up this big underwater net, and he shot off all of his torpedoes at it, and, he, and they basically marked the holes in the net where mm. you know, all the torpedoes went, and they were aiming at the same place every time. But the holes in the net were all right. over the place, yeah. so he could say, "Look, you know, it's not operator error because the people here in Newport were mostly saying, we're building them correctly. It's that you know, you guys using them, you're either, yeah, you're not uh, aiming them correctly, or you're, you're not maintaining them. You know, you got to do a lot of maintenance on these things to keep the machinery working. So they would blame them, and then the captains would say, no, 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 we're doing everything correctly. It's you know, manufacturer error, basically. <laughs> so I see. They finally worked out." Uh, most of the problems by 1943, but the major ones being the, when they had tested them here in Narragansett Bay, mostly they were doing it with training warheads, which were heavier, or were, sorry, not as heavy as the actual explosive warheads. And so it found that when they were trying to make these run at a certain depth, all of the, the initial settings on these were thrown off because mm, they makes were sense. calibrating it to the, the training warheads and not the uh, actual explosive warheads. I see. Um, and there were a couple of more problems, things like air leaking into these and throwing off the gyroscopes that kept it on, on track. And, um, a couple of different things that finally just took a long time to figure out. But eventually they did, and eventually got it up to, once they got above about a 70% success rate, they considered that good enough for, 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 government, <laughs> for government work. For government work. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. But, but it did take a while to get there, and it was, led to a lot of frustration. Okay, so by the end of the Second World War, we start to perfect to 70% the torpedoes, and that sets the stage for Cold War era. So yeah, this is a nice little display just kind of showing the, the evolution of torpedoes uh, since World War II. Um, the main idea being, as you can kind of tell, if you compare this with the Mark 14, they're much smaller, they're much lighter. <laughs> they, you know, they're all made of like composite materials now. Um, so they, uh, you know, they're much more powerful, of course. Um, we don't have an example of an This is like a display model here of uh, a Mark 54, which is kind of like an 80s and 90s era torpedo. But I believe they're still used by some of the, the ships in the fleet. But um, yeah, the main idea is, of course, they're all, you know, they don't run on gyroscopes anymore. They're all, you know, very sophisticated tracking methods and, and sonar and, and uh, uh, listening devices to help uh, track and guide them. But but um, yeah, the main idea is just how much it's all shrunk, just like all technology. You know, mm. it's much smaller than it used to be, and, and much more lighter weight, and much more reliable. Okay, so I guess as the last kind of finishing thread that we mentioned, so this is all the development of torpedoes essentially, and then the technology that surrounds it. So can you touch real briefly on maybe how that was taught at the War College, or maybe that sure. aspect of it? Yeah, so it comes into play, uh, like we were saying, with the early torpedo boats, how there wasn't really any uh, what the Navy calls doctrine in terms of like, you know, kind of a, a set of instructions that kind of guides how torpedoes and torpedo boats should be used in the early um, U.S. Navy. When, when navies first started building torpedo boats, um, the main question was you know, how to sort of integrate them with the rest of the fleet. And the initial idea being that, you know, you would have your nice long columns of battleships that would be sailing into battle. And these torpedo boats were supposed to sort of like dart out from the line and go launch them at the enemy battleships and turn around and come back. Um, they have almost no armor, no protection on them, but their defense is speed. So the main idea being that you know the, the battleship guns couldn't track them and fire at them accurately enough to yeah to uh, uh, to do that. And I think that's the idea at the Battle of Jutland. They were thinking like speed or firepower, which is more important. And I think it aired towards more firepower. 
Yeah, there's um, a lot of uh, Jutland is one that they uh, is a battle that's studied here um, in the 20s and 30s, um, and uh, is always held up as a case study and right. sort of um, uh, not necessarily the technology changes soon after that, so you, they don't really look to Jutland as an example of you know tactics to be repeated in a future war, but they do look at it as a case study in decision making and leadership and um, different philosophies. Uh, they they uh, note that the British torpedo boats at Jutland were used in a very defensive role. So there are, their ideal use of the, using that speed to go out and attack the enemy's battleships, the British didn't really use them that way because they were very afraid of the German submarines, <laughs> the other main threat to capital ships at that point. And they kind of held their torpedo boats in closer to their fleet to try and chase off the German submarines that they thought were there. Actually, they were not, but, but it was the threat of them that held them. The Germans, on the other hand, absolutely make use of their destroyers, and they jut out in uh, these famous turnaround moves that the German fleet makes at that battle. They first send out their destroyers to lay a smoke screen to hide the withdrawal of the German fleet, and then launch a whole spread of torpedoes at the British fleet that forces the British to turn away to avoid them and allows the Germans to get away. So. Yeah, that's, um, that's a great example of a historical battle that's studied here at the college and is used to sort of help Navy officers think through uh, different ways of uh, torpedo boat and destroyer usage. You know, should they be held as part of the main battle fleet? Should they go off on their own and kind of do their own thing? Should they be used as scouts or should they be used more in terms of in the battle itself? All those questions are things that they think about here in, in, in detail in those years. Great, I think this has been a great example of yeah, tracing technology and putting us in a place to maybe see the War College in action and see a little bit of those displays. So we'll move on with that, thank you. So we're now in the training station gallery and what we're gonna be doing today is covering a bit of the, the revamping of the training that the War College was able to do. So we talked previously about them getting into the enlisted officers, starting to develop potentially war gaming, but this is gonna be for the, uh, I guess the rank and file training. Right, yeah. So yeah, as we said before, um, so Stephen B. Luce, the, the founder of the college, was uh, very much involved in, in this aspect of the, the basis history too. In the same way that he was concerned with improving the way officers were trained in the Navy. He also was concerned about the enlisted sailors and the training they were getting. Um, in the late 1800s, the Navy still pretty much operated on the model that it used uh, almost since the revolution of uh, recruiting sailors and that they, they mostly just recruited uh, people who were already sailors, like merchant sailors in the major port cities on the East Coast. And, and they would have uh, recruiting stations set up there and just try to get people to sign on to the Navy for a year or two. Um, and you didn't have any kind of basic training. There was no boot camp to go to. You just went off to your ship, and you know, they usually had the older guys on the ship start teaching you the tools of the trade, and then off you went. And just like with the officers, um, that's not, you know, it's not to say that that system didn't work. It certainly got the Navy through the Civil War and other major area, uh, major engagements that it fought in. But um, just as with the officer training, Luce felt like there's probably a better way to do this. And he really pushed for the Navy to start um, shore-based training for its enlisted sailors. He wasn't the first one to argue for that. Um, a couple others had tried to board him and it never really got the, the idea to, to take off. But he finally uh, succeeded in that and got this apprentice training program established here at the training station in Newport. And so that becomes the first version of, of basic training that the Navy uses. Um, so the idea was um, for uh, mostly teenage boys, um, the minimum age changed over time, but uh, at times they took people as young as 14 years old and you can sign up to be an apprentice, which means that you came here to Newport um, mostly for about a six month period where you would be training on land first, you can see them, you know, doing uh, training, climbing up on a mast here, practicing sail handling, um, going through all the skills that a sailor needed, and uh, and then you would do a practice cruise. They had training ships, this is a model, of one of them, the Minnesota, where you would go out on a practice cruise and sometimes sail to Europe and back or down to the Bahamas, <laughs> um, and just uh, practice being out at sea. And we'd said, uh, when we were discussing this before, so kind of typical training that you would expect um, 
as a part of that, there are some holdovers to kind of older tradition. We yeah. noted the picture where people are seeing their fencing and doing whatnot. So there's a little bit of tradition and not so much looking forward with every aspect of the training. Yeah, this, this whole the training program is, is being done at a very uh, important time in the Navy's history where it's going through this transformative period from moving on from the sailing ships that had formed the bulk of the fleet in the Civil War. Um, but, but sailing ships were now obsolete. Uh, ships were now being made out of uh, you know, steel and iron and uh, using explosive shells rather than solid cannonballs. Um, and the Navy was uh, entering this period they called the New Steel Navy, where they were by building, finally building modern battleships uh, to compete with the major European navies. So in a, uh, to go along with the way that they were changing ship design, they also had to change the way that sailors were trained. So they... Uh, they did include some holdovers from those earlier days, and you can see here this the uh, what's mounted in the case here that are called a single stick, which is basically like a practice sword. And uh, even though this is the late 18, that photo is from 1899. So at that point, they certainly weren't expecting to have too many more sword battles in, in uh, the Navy's history. But um, they used this actually as a form of physical training. Uh, um, you know, we get up and do PT in the mornings. They would have them practice, do mock sword battles just to get some exercise. And um, they did actually talk about it too as a way to sort of teach like the heritage of the Navy, of, you know, the traditions of the old Navy and help these new sailors that were on board these new ships that were, everything about them was new and untried and untested. You need some grounding. Some of the, yeah, <laughs> the, the, you know, the uniforms, the, the swords and all things were a way to sort of <clears throat> help them feel the continuity with, with their early Navy's history. So now we're going to be looking at another one of the displays, talking a bit more in depth about the specific training that they would have done. So can you walk us through kind of what we're seeing here? Sure. So we're basically looking at the uh, years leading right up to World War I, when the base undergoes its first real big expansion. Uh, the apprentice training program kind of wraps up by about 1904, and uh, they go to a, a shorter program. It's not six months anymore. It's just usually a, a few weeks and a few months at the most. Um, where they bring in uh, people from all over the country now and train them here to be enlisted sailors. Um, so the base, um, although it starts out here just on the island, it spreads to some of the, the uh, land just across the, the island from us, Coddington Point, where they build these big barracks to house the sailors. And um, they, uh, the training that they get, um, again, we're looking at kind of the physical training aspect of it here. Um, so the interest in physical fitness and exercise is something that's kind of sweeping through the U.S. at this time. It's becoming a thing now to sort of, uh, you know, as people's lives get a little more sedentary, more people are working in offices, or kind of getting away from the agrarian roots of the country, and more people are in cities and office buildings. There's more of an interest in doing things to help stay physically fit and active, and that spreads over to the military as well. Um, so they start, um, you know, every day we think about that being a huge part of basic training. That wasn't always the case, but it is here now. So you see the photos of these young guys all lined up here. And, um, in the early years, they tended to be these big kind of group exercises where you see they're all like these coordinated movements where they're all kind of moving in unison. And With the aid of uh, yeah. dum <laughs> dummy weights and clubs. So they had these Indian clubs that they used um, where they were holding these things out. And they basically functioned as weights to try and give your arms a little bit more of a workout too. Uh, they still did, um, you know, they had things that are sort of like intramural sports. So things like fencing that, again, kind of draw on military traditions anyway. Those are always a popular uh, training tool. Um, you see them doing rifle drill down here where lifting them up and using them as weights again. Um, so all of that is a very, very important part of basic training in this time period. Um, but uh, in World War I, the, they uh, kind of go through an explosion here, bringing many more people here to train than they ever did before. Who, who aren't necessarily all from sailor backgrounds. Exactly, yeah, not anymore. So now they're recruiting people more from the interior of the country, and they don't necessarily have those maritime skills. So in addition to things like you know, learning how to wear the uniform, learning how to march, learning to be physically fit, um, you know, they're just going through very basic seamanship kind of skills and doing some very, uh, see them here training on radios. Um, there were a lot of different schools that were part of this here, so... Um, People would train to be, uh, you know, uh, radio equipment operators to repair things, to uh, 
uh, work with various different types of equipment to be yeomen, which were uh, like clerks, like secretaries, um, uh, logistics people, chaplains. Um, all those places had schools here at one time or another at the base. During World War I, one of the big things is that's the first time that women are allowed to enlist in the Navy. Um, they brought them on as part of the yeoman school. So again, yeoman being uh, sort of like the clerks and the secretaries for the Navy. Um, they uh, allowed women to officially enlist in the Navy for the first time. They had served in the Navy, uh, not in an official enlisted status, but sort of as volunteers, as nurses um, in the years before this. But this was the first time they were actually joining the Navy and had rank and everything just like everybody else. Makes sense. Okay, so this, yeah, things are ramping up. They're including more of the country, and then they're experimenting, I guess, with the training regimen and all that. Uh, but I guess typically the impetus for all this kind of ratcheting up is going to be the world wars. Oh, sure. Uh, and I think that's what you, what you guys have over here. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, obviously when a war comes, um, training, wherever it's happening, is usually compressed. So they try and spit out people much more quickly to get them out there to the ships where they're needed. And just a quick question. So in the training, this looks like a, some, a German man? Well, so yeah, this is actually, uh, this is a photo of a parade in downtown Newport. Um, they would have parades all the time where they would bring the sailors from the training station to march in them. This particular one is a war bond drive where um, the big uh, war bond effort they had in World War One, trying to sell bonds to help fund the war effort. And so they had Various events, they had speakers that would go out and try and give, you know, patriotic speeches to uh, uh, convince people to buy these bonds. So this parade is actually showing that somebody dressed up as a German soldier <laughs> with this woman. So in the early part of the war, uh, the big thing was the atrocities that were committed by uh, the German army, especially in Belgium, yeah. that were turned into this big propaganda tool for the, the Allies. Um, and so that's, they're alluding to that here, trying I see. to use that as sort of like the motivational tool for why you should buy bonds to prevent that from happening again. Okay, so they're ramping up uh, the training, and I guess at this point there's a divergence with the Germans who previously they had maybe tried to learn from. Uh, is it at the, this point that they're enlisting more help from Great Britain and like the Allies? Um, yeah, I mean the, the basic training model, yeah, at this point has sort of evolved to the point where um, uh, it's becoming more of its own. There are I see. You know, fewer outside influences at this point. But yeah, they, you know, they still borrowed a lot of German ideas in the beginning. But the U.S. was certainly growing closer to Great Britain at this point. Um, although even up until 1917, when uh, when when the U.S. enters the war, um, you know, it's the whole backstory of the U.S. joining World War One. We originally didn't think we would, and then Wilson. You know, campaigns on a promise to not get the U.S. into the war, and then does because of a variety of events that happen, especially involving German submarines, uh, which we get which, over here exactly. Yeah, um, but that that plays a lot into changing alliances and all. But even the be uh, up until when the U.S. Navy's first uh, uh, the senior officer Admiral Sims, who goes over to be the commander of U.S. forces in Europe during World War One. Um, is told by the chief of naval operations that uh, he shouldn't get too close to the British because we'd just as soon be fighting them as the Germans. <laughs> sure. So there was always a sense of, uh, you know, we have, uh, as I think the British put it, we have like permanent interests but not permanent alliances. So, <laughs> yeah. so the U.S. operates somewhat the same way. But um, so, yeah, with the German U boats, the Newport has this uh, great story of, of kind of the, the lead up to World War I. In the fall of 1916, Newport got a visit from a German submarine, U-53. Um, so this is in the area where they are in the time period where the U.S. is still neutral. And when under the rules of neutrality, when a foreign warship uh, comes to a port, you you have to allow them to enter and to dock and to stay there for 24 hours to you know, rest, refuel, whatever they need to do. Um, you can't. Uh, keep some ships away and let others come in or else you're not being neutral and you're going to be uh, somebody declare war on you. So to stay neutral, they had to allow the ship. So U-53 just showed up here on the morning um, of October 6th, or actually, sorry, it's not, uh, October 7th. <laughs> so on the morning of October 7th, U-53 showed up unannounced, uh, just appeared in the entrance to uh, Narragansett Bay and uh, requested permission to dock. They, they granted it, and they came. And uh, the captain here, you see Hans Rose, is the German commander of U-53. 
Um, he comes out and meets the staff and the faculty and the president of the Naval War College and <laughs> creates yeah. quite a stir here. Nobody is quite sure, you know, what to do. Should we, you know, we don't want to be unfriendly, but we're, we're certainly, this is well after, um, uh, you know, German U-boats have sunk ships that killed Americans, uh, mostly, uh, most famously with the Lusitania, the main uh, ship that was sunk in 1915 that had uh, 128 Americans on board but lost their lives to that. So... This was creating quite a diplomatic uh, stir between the U.S. and the Germans. But nevertheless, um, Hans Rose met with uh, the officers here at the base, and on the surface of it, um, was very friendly. You know, was was absolutely, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, wanted to follow protocol and uh, pay a courtesy visit to everybody that he was supposed to. Um, basically, said, "We're just here." Uh, for a day to, you know, send in the mail, send some messages, stretch our legs, get some fresh air, and then we'll be gone on a little bit. Um, they invited all of the people on the base to come visit uh, and take a tour of the U-boat. And of course, when they got on board, everything was spit polished clean, you know, looks great as new. Um, it was very much meant to sort of show off the U-boat and, and see what a great piece of engineering it was. So uh, that evening, um, he pulled off and said, thanks very much for your hospitality. We'll be off now. And so you see here, he left the bay and came out and parked himself right in the main shipping channel that led up the East Coast to Halifax, Canada, where um, all the merchant ships that were traveling across the Atlantic to take supplies and material to the armies fighting in France, they would usually take that route. So he parked himself there and started looking for ships to sink and uh, started sinking ships that were not American flagged. I see. Um, so he sank other country ships that were uh, carrying war material who were under the rules of war were liable to be sunk for that. But this is still the point where um, one of the points in the war where the Germans are not using unrestricted submarine warfare. They're actually operating in a much more traditional manner where they uh, they're on the surface, they're not submerged, and they stop a ship, and they board the ship, and they confirm that it's carrying supplies meant for their enemies, and then they have to give everybody on the ship time to get off first, and only then do they sink it. So um, Hans Rose ended up sinking five ships that day. Nobody was killed. Um, he allowed everybody to get off board first, but... Um, the destroyers, there was a destroyer force here in Newport, started getting these distress calls from these uh, foreign flag vessels, alerting them to the fact. And so American destroyers rush out there and start picking up survivors. But at that point, their hands are tied. They can't really fire so, upon yeah, the vessel. So yeah, the hard thing for them is they're not allowed to interfere with what's going on in any way, even though they know what's happening. So they, uh, you know, there are other neutral ships coming up the bay here that the destroyers get, uh, get in touch with. They are not allowed to tell them over the radio, hey, look out, there's a U-boat up ahead. Um, there's one almost comical scene that uh, they write about at the end of this where um, uh, the American destroyers are there picking U-boats out of the water, and Captain Rose actually gets on the radio to one of them, says, can you please move your ship out of the way? I'm trying to torpedo the next one in line <laughs> behind you. Yeah. And they have to do it. They have to abide by that, or else they're, again, going to break neutrality. Wow. So... The real purpose of his visit was not friendly, of course. It was to sort of send this diplomatic message to the U.S. saying, look at what we can do. This is just one U-boat. You know, imagine what a whole fleet of them can do if we have these parked off the East Coast. Don't get involved in the war. But ironically, it was largely because of those submarine attacks, and especially when Germany was using unrestricted submarine warfare, where it was all done, surprise attacks, and no time to get off, that that's one of the big elements that does draw the U.S. into the war. Great. Yeah, thanks for sharing that story. That's amazing. And I guess the rest of the room right now does cover a couple different topics. Um, but I think for the most part, this cover is kind of the, a good piece of the narrative. Uh, is there anything else along this wall that you wanted to cover? So, um, you know, we have a model of the U-53 just to show you kind of what it looked like there. This is the one that had been parked. So this is the one that visited Newport. So um, you can see uh, it looks pretty similar to a World War II V boat too, but a very small cramped vessel and not one you would want to spend a lot of time trapped inside crossing the Atlantic. So <laughs> it was still still quite a feat to get one of these things all the way across the ocean even at that time. Um, a couple of other models are um, the Constellation. 
two of its forms. Is this one of those training vessels, or this so is more of? It was, although this um, this constellation was one of the original six frigates that was built for the Navy when it was established in 1797. Um, there was uh, the constellation does end up coming here to Newport and is used as a training vessel, although it's the later constellation. Um, the, the original constellation was basically completely disassembled and, and rebuilt as a new ship just before the Civil War. And it's this later constellation that comes up to be a training vessel. So one of the ones that trained all those apprentices that we were talking about before, they were on board the ship for a long time. Um, it's actually still here in World War II. And at that point, it's purely, obviously, a ceremonial ship. And it's, it's actually the uh, ceremonial flagship for the Atlantic fleet at that point. So. Theoretically, the admiral in charge of that fleet would have had that as a ship to have his office yeah. and quarters on. And um, obviously, it did not believe the appointment was not used in World War II, but it was here um, through the 1950s. Well, great. Fascinating. Thank you. All right, and now in this room, we're going to be covering a bit of the details of the specifics of the training. So we've gone through enlistment and kind of the enlargement of the college and some of the uh, world history surrounding it. But now we're going to drill down to some of the specifics of what was taught here. Yeah, so with the college's curriculum, um, you know, the, the early years were very much a time of experimentation of what should be taught at the college. And the subject of history was always a very important one, even from the beginning. Um, they, uh, the early faculty of the college very much wanted to use uh, historical battles to teach uh, thinking to its uh, senior officers you know, how to think about tactical uh, problems um, and looking at examples of naval battles from history to sort of inspire them and help them learn the process that senior officers use to think through these really difficult, complex problems that you have to be able to sort of deal with in very short periods of time and under a lot of stress. So, 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 so curriculum at this point would have been people doing their like general physical training, learning how to be on the ship, and then supplemented so by this? So War College, um, most of what they're doing is classroom-based training. Okay. You're getting a scene like this. So this is a great scene of a class from 1888, um, which we think was probably done right in this room right here. But um, on the upper level here of, of, uh, of uh, Founders Hall, um, where the college was started. They're using this. You can see they've got a chart here. The instructor is talking about, you can see the uh, lines here showing how the fleets moved. So they're talking about uh, battle from history and then uh, uh, telling, uh, using this as a sort of an object lesson in, in tactical thinking. Um, so with history, um, it's gone through kind of ebbs and tides in, in the various or ebbs and flows as it, as it goes. With, Maybe we can uh, stand over here. So yeah, when you're talking about history, I mean, it goes way, way back. They would have studied like yeah. control of the Mediterranean. You can see the Greek and Roman triremes. You know, they often <clears> tried <throat> to use, um, they wanted to look for sort of uh, analogs and parallels. Close, I would say like closely contemporary examples so that they're, um, you know, examples that the students would have been familiar with. And, and there might be some carryover in terms of the technology hadn't changed too much. But there were definitely many periods, and still are, where they look at, you know, yeah, examples from ancient history even. So um, in the 1970s, the president of the college at the time, Admiral Stansfield Turner, um, was another big believer in making history an important part of the curriculum. And his, one of his main contributions was this is happening right after Vietnam. And a lot of the officers and students here at the college who had just been, or maybe recently came back from Vietnam, they were trying to, you know, make obviously what they're teaching here at the college relevant to that generation. And they wanted to talk about, um, you know, all the lessons that the military could draw from its involvement in Vietnam, but it was still really hard to do that because it was still very controversial. And a lot of the students had pretty strong opinions about, you know, what worked, what didn't work, and you know, mm. how the war should or should not have been fought. And, in, and he found that it was hard to have classroom discussions where it didn't get heated or it was, you know, personal opinion didn't just kind of drown out everything. And so Turner's thought was um, trying to use more examples of ancient history to sort of use them as a proxy for Vietnam. And so he especially was interested in uh, the wars between Athens and Sparta um, and looked at the Peloponnesian War as a it's war that always highly had a very sort of a lot of parallels with Vietnam in terms of the, the downfall of Athens and all. And he used that as a way to discuss the problems involved in Vietnam without actually mentioning Vietnam. Makes and, sense. And that's <laughs> where we see a lot of these classroom movements, the models 
some of the Athenian leaders like Themistocles that uh, get a lot of coverage in class at that time, and that's where that comes from. Yeah, awesome. So, moving on to the side, so this is looking to the past, learning from history, maybe as a proxy for the modern era, but a lot of looking at the past. Uh, and this is where the U.S. fleet has to reform. Mm -hmm. um, so could you talk to us a bit about maybe what this represents over here? Sure. So over here, we're <laughs> talking about uh, in the early 1900s, just before World War I. Teddy Roosevelt, a very instantly recognizable figure, <laughs> um, is very closely connected with the college's early years. And he's a big advocate for the college um, at a time when the Navy as a whole was not convinced that the Naval War College was needed. Um, <clears throat> there were a lot of people at various times kind of working to either close the college or restrict its role because they just thought it was a waste of money and wasn't needed. Teddy Roosevelt, um, of course, had done his uh, PhD at Harvard. He had written a very well-known book about the War of 1812, was very much uh, a proponent of building a strong Navy. So in the first decade of the 1900s, um, especially after the British launched their revolutionary ship HMS Dreadnought, which changes everybody's thinking about you know, what a, a battleship should be and how navies should be built around them, the question for the U.S. Navy was, how do we respond to that? How do we, uh, you know, what types of ships should we build? Should we build all battleships? Should we build battleships and destroyers? Should the battleships have all big guns or should they have a mix of armament? All of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and they have um, a couple of conferences here um, at Newport to hold meetings about that and decide what the policy is going to be. Uh, the Navy also uh, institutes a new body called the General Board, which is kind of a, a, a meeting of a very exclusive group of the highest ranking officers and leaders of the Navy that kind of put their heads together to come come up with some guiding policy about you know, building programs. Okay, um, so increasingly the Naval World College is not just for training up people who are going to be participating, but more of a think tank yeah, as well. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. In, in this period, um, it's not exactly not just a school, but it's actually tied to the more like policy making hmm. bodies within the Navy. And for a while, um, for a very short time, they they try to get the Navy to produce the official war plans that that guide you know the, the plans that would govern a future war if it were to break out, which we'll talk a little bit about more in World War One too, but. Um, they kind of resist that. A lot of the presidents at the college don't want the college to be used that way. They really want it to kind of stay what, what it was intended for as, as a training opportunity for, mm. for senior officers. But yeah, in that early period, kind of uh, until the 1930s, there's still um, this, this very close association with the senior policymaking bodies within the Navy where they're, they're getting the college to be almost like a, a laboratory to try out different policies, different uh, different war plans, whatever it may be. And, and at this point, I imagine the college has been around long enough that you have graduates who are starting to return and come exactly. back. Exactly, and the graduates are on that general board. Yeah. The graduates are part of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the various groups that at times that did the official war plans. They're eventually, by the 1930s, everybody involved in war plans, almost everybody is a war college graduate. So they've all had a common education, a common vocabulary to draw off of, a common understanding of what the major you know, challenges for the Navy was going to be coming up. So they're able to use that to, to uh, guide the, the Navy's war planning efforts. Okay. Well, maybe as we pivot, then we can take a look at this table. So you're talking about them. It starts to move from just training on here's how we work with our current ships mm -hmm. to now think tanking about what we do in the future. And that's coupled with war gaming that's developing and making its way to the U.S. It had happened a little bit before this time period, but now it's starting to become maybe a, a more important part of the curriculum. So yeah. we'll talk real briefly about this, and we'll do future videos about diving into this. But maybe you can okay. give us a little bit of an overview. Sure, yeah. So yeah, war gaming was an important part of the curriculum, even from when the college was first founded in 1886. The William McCarty Little joins the staff and, and uh, pushes for the, the uh, introduction of war gaming into the curriculum. So it's still here today. It's bigger and more complicated than it's ever been. But we do have an example of kind of a small tabletop game. This would have been used in the 1920s and 30s. Um, when gaming first came on the scene here, most of it was tactical level gaming. So we're talking about you know individual ships. Small encounters. Small groups of ships. And the emphasis being on how to maneuver, how to gain an advantage, you know, how to 
um, over the years, the gaming has become much bigger in scope, so it's more operational and strategic level than it is tactical now. But so it started on the board, and later you have chart battles exactly, and things like that. Exactly, where it takes up whole rooms, and eventually, of course, becomes computerized. But this small tabletop game, um, you can see, uses, you know, just not, these are not detailed models. These are just meant enough to represent a ship or a squadron of ships. They can be used to represent various types of ships depending on the needs of the game. But the basic idea was you would have a couple teams of players. Um, these were not just one player versus one player. They would be whole teams against each other where you know, each person would be in charge of a ship or maybe a, a detachment of the fleet. There would be an overall commander. Um, these are red and blue. Most they usually referred to the two sides as the red team and the blue team. Um, and these were umpired games, too. So the idea being that um, the players did not necessarily see the entire battle. They could only see what the umpires judged they could see under real-world conditions. So if the other side decided to lay a smoke screen with the destroyers, they might actually put up a curtain in the <laughs> middle of the game or the board so that um, the other side couldn't see what would not be visible, um, given the fact that there was a smoke screen in place. So they, they had ways to sort of represent fog of war like that. Um, they had people recording what would happen. Um, these things were very heavily, you know, they would do very in-depth reports and after-action reviews afterwards to try and tease out, you know, what are the major lessons you learn from playing this game? And the students would write papers about their experiences at the end of their classroom, at, at the end of their year at the college. So um, there was a lot that went into it. Um, you know, they had, uh, most of these are, are uh, they would use protractors or rulers to sort of measure the range, and they would have tables that would tell them if you're firing at a certain ship at a certain distance from a certain angle, this is how much damage you cause. Um, some of them used dice, not many of them did. Um, a lot of the early ones were actually, it was just a fixed amount of uh, what damage you would do, so they didn't have to take time rolling dice, which makes them last longer. But some of the later ones did. So. Um, and these were very portable, too. These were meant to be used. You could play them here at the college, but they had these little kits you could use, and you could actually take these with you out onto a ship and even play them out there at sea. So they were meant to sort of help spread the college's influence throughout the whole Navy very easily, and then wargaming was the way they did that. Makes sense. Great, thanks. So this covers the curriculum, and we can get into uh, where the rubber meets the road. So we're now at the point of the visit where the rubber is going to meet the road. We've been talking about the curriculum, the training, and then now we're getting into the First World War. So you can walk us through this. It's mostly going to be talking about the U.S. enters the war, and then at the end we're going to wrap up how the experiences of that war influenced the war college and the training that they did. Um, so he'll walk us through a little bit of the details here. Yeah, so um, for the Navy, the, the Naval War College actually closes during World War One. They decide that they need everybody here involved in the war effort. So. Um, there's not much going on here in Newport, but um, the important thing for us is that the president of the college at the time, Admiral William Sims, um, is uh, picked to be the, the commander of all U.S. naval forces in Europe during the war. So he's going to be the guy that kind of coordinates how the U.S. Navy plays a role in the larger Allied naval war effort. Um, Sims was known as uh, kind of a controversial figure in the Navy. He had very publicly challenged the Navy's decisions about um, things like battleship design in the early 1900s. He thought American battleships were had a lot of uh, technical faults and errors in the way they were built, and he, he kind of publicly <laughs> called out the Navy's senior leaders on that and made a lot of enemies, but made some important friends, too, um, including Teddy Roosevelt, who we uh, talked about earlier. So he's able to survive the controversy and um, rise to the, the Navy's senior senior ranks. And these are the main things that are starting to happen. So the advent of the battleship, and then you have the, the U-boats, so a lot of new pieces being introduced to the warfare. Right. So by the time the U.S. gets involved in, in the, the First World War, the, the U-boat threat is really the main thing that the, the, the Allied navies are trying to do with and contain. Um, the Battle of Jutland has already happened at this point, so the German surface fleet is not much of a factor anymore. It's those U-boats that are the main threat, especially to American ships that we're now going to be sailing across the Atlantic. So um, the U.S. Navy, um, one of their main jobs, of course, is the American destroyers, which were uh, sent over to, to uh, Queenstown, Ireland, where they set up a base and, and operated with the Royal Navy to try and hunt down those U-boats and at least escort convoys across the Atlantic so they wouldn't be sunk. 
They also helped with laying mines in the North Sea to try and trap the, the German U-boats in the North Sea so they couldn't get out to the North Atlantic. Um, the Navy also contributed naval aviation, so they had uh, naval aircraft that were flying trying to spot U-boats. Um, the Navy loaned a few of its big battleship guns to use as artillery for the land war in France, so they mounted them on these enormous uh, yeah, the railway gun. That had the railway guns. So yeah, the Navy was involved in that way too. Um, one squadron of American battleships actually be, uh, joined the Grand Fleet and operated as part of the, the Royal Navy's main fleet in the North Sea and um, continued to patrol it through the end of the war and would have fought another battle with the High Seas Fleet if it had come out for another fight after Jutland. It didn't, but it could have happened. And uh, so Admiral Sims is, is kind of the main go-between for the U.S. Um, between the U.S. and uh, the Royal Navy. Unlike the Army, that very much kind of resisted integration <laughs> into uh, uh, the Allied armies. You know, Pershing very famously did not want the U.S. Army to be part of, sort of fed as reinforcements to the Allied armies. Sims, on the other hand, very much did want the U.S. Navy to not operate its own, but to kind of join the, the, the larger Allied naval war effort. So he is the main point man for that. And by the time it's all over, when they come back after the end of the war, you know, Sims has a lot of has had a lot of experience um, dealing with the higher level operational and strategic issues that the Royal Navy faced during the war, and. Um, has had a lot of time to think about what the U.S. Navy did well, what it didn't do so well, and, and what uh, needed to change in terms of that senior level training again. And he comes back here, and um, the War College goes through a good uh, period of a few years where they really take a serious look at the curriculum. They come up with a new uh, board of officers that looks at revamping the curriculum. And one of the things that really changes war game um, again, and again, it kind of takes this turn now more towards higher level operational and strategic thinking. Um, Sims felt like, uh, was very much of the mind of the U.S. Navy, just in general terms, didn't have a plan for fighting in World War I. It was better plan. Basically had to make up something on the spot after uh, the U.S. joined the war. And then he felt very much that the planning side needed to be more thought out. And so that was one of the things he was pushing here a few years after returning to Newport. So they, op they construct new facilities with the express purpose of being for war gaming? Right, yeah, so Pringle Hall here opens in 1934. As a result, a lot of these discussions, um, war gaming had been happening at Loose Hall, which is one of the, the first buildings built for the college after it moved out of this building. And the rooms in Loose Hall were good, but they were tended to be kind of small classroom-sized buildings. And as you can see in Pringle Hall, this is like a basketball court. <laughs> There's like a lot of room yeah. to spread out and, and play much larger scenarios, have more people involved. That's the direction that they were taking. At that point, too, they were starting to identify Japan as the, the most likely uh, enemy that the U.S. would be fighting in the next war in the Pacific. And so more and more of the games featured Japan as the enemy, whereas before World War I, it was either Germany or Great Britain that was most often the opponent. I understand. And then we'll be talking, I mean, at later points in maybe the videos, more in depth about this, how it worked, the different scenarios that they did, the influence on World War II. Um, but while we're here, maybe you can tell me a bit more. So they founded it, they used it, in the ramp up to the war with Japan, use it throughout the Second World War, and then what's kind of the history of these facilities after that, into the Cold War and into the modern era? Sure, so uh, war gaming is in Pringle Hall um, in 1930s until the early 1950s when they built uh, a computer simulation over in Sims Hall. It's called News, the Naval Electronic Warfare yeah. Simulator, and at that point when it becomes computerized is when it all moves off-site. So, that room is still there. Um, it's used as a student lounge now. So unfortunately, you can't see that nice war gaming floor that's been carpeted over now, <laughs> but the, the room is still there. Um, and uh, you can still see actually the balcony up here where you would have had like the umpires and the observers looking down on the, on the floor to see what was going on and comment on it. Um, that part is still there too. But um, yeah, it's, you know, once, once war gaming becomes computerized, this facility is not going to do the job anymore, so it moves out of there at that point. Comes obsolete. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, we'll see you guys in the other videos. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome.